Okay, hello. Uh, welcome to the Holocaust Memorial and Tolerance Center's Curator's Corner. My name is Thorne Tritter and I am the Museum and Programming Director at HMTC, which is located in Glen Cove, New York. Uh, this online program is part of a series, a weekly series that we started a few weeks ago as a way to share information about particular objects in our collection while our building is closed. I hope, of course, as I always uh, do in these programs, to, uh, to wish you all a healthy and safe time and, and hope you're doing well. Uh, before I start, let me also, as I always try to do, encourage you to pose any questions that come up during my talk by hitting the Q&A button down at the bottom or top of your screen and typing in your question. I'll try and respond at the end of the program. I might not get, it, get to it while we're speaking, or while I'm speaking. Um, okay, today I want to focus on some postcards in our second gallery that were sent from Jews imprisoned in two different ghettos, one in Wołomin, Poland, and one in the Czech city of Terezin, which the Germans had renamed after the 1938 annexation of the Sudetenland as Theresienstadt. And just a word about Polish pronunciations. As you may know, the W in Polish is pronounced like the English V while the L with a line through it is pronounced like the English W. And so what looks to the American reader as Wallamin is pronounced in Polish as Wołomin. Anyway, um, the ghettos of Wołomin and Terezin offer insights into the variations that existed in different Nazi ghettos and also many of the similarities. And I wanna say a special thanks to the people who donated these postcards to our collection, Miriam Fingerhut, and Phyllis and Stanley Sanders. Uh, sadly, Stanley Sanders passed away a couple of years ago, but I'm personally grateful to Phyllis Sanders and her sister-in-law, Ina Sanders, and Miriam Fingerhut for taking the time recently to talk with me about their family histories and to help me understand these documents. Okay, so we have uh, four postcards, each from these two different ghettos, with the four from Wołomin coming from 1941, while the four from Theresien were written in 1943 and 1944. The dates of the postcards are actually noteworthy, but before I get to that, let me back up and say a couple of words about the Nazi plan that led to the creation of these ghettos. Almost immediately after invading Poland on September 1st, 1939, Nazi Germany planned to centralize and contain the Jewish population in ghettos that were to be established in major cities. The ghettos were a key step in the Nazi process of brutally separating and persecuting the Jewish community. They were planned as enclosed districts that isolated Jews from the non-Jewish populations and where living, living conditions were made deplorable. I do wanna emphasize that the Nazi plan to place Jews in ghettos was before they came up with their plan of genocide. The Nazi initial plan in 1939 was not genocide, but containment and expulsion. The ghettos were initially developed as a step toward expulsion, although they later became a central component of genocide. One of the helpful sources about the early plan is a letter from Reinhard Heydrich, at the time the head of the, um, the security police, and later placed in charge of the Reich security main office. On September 21st, 1939, he wrote a letter to the leaders of the Einsatzgruppen, the special killing units that were fanning out through Poland, targeting the leaders of Polish society and the leaders of the Jewish community. He wrote, the first prerequisite for the final aim is the concentration of the Jews from the countryside into the larger cities. Note, he says the final aim, not final solution. And it's a little vague what he means when he says final aim in 1939 in this letter, but it was not the mass genocide that we think of as the final solution. Concentration in the major cities near railway lines was a logical first step to the deportation of the Jewish community and their expulsion. He continued in, in his letter to the Einsatzgruppen leaders saying, Jewish communities of fewer than 500 persons are to be transferred to the nearest city of concentration. And he also added, a council of Jewish elders is to be set up fully responsible for the exact and punctual execution of all directives. The Judenrat, as you may well know, 
uh, are one of the more controversial topics in discussing Jewish responses to the Holocaust. On the one hand, these committees helped create order in the chaos of the newly formed ghettos and worked to establish schools, hospitals, soup kitchens, uh, and other relief programs in the ghetto. On the other hand, their work helped the Nazis, as the Nazis didn't have to actively manage the ghettos once the Judenrats had been established. I'm not really going to talk about the Judenrat, but they're certainly well worth more discussion. My main point, however, is that in September of 1939, the Nazis had this plan to round up all the Jews and put them into designated areas within major cities. This slide gives you a sense of the scale of their plans. Here's a map showing where the major ghettos were created. In all, the Nazis created over 1,100 ghettos. Let me go back, however, to our postcards. The four earlier ones were sent from the ghetto in Vowoman, a small town about 25 miles northeast, uh, sorry, north uh, east of Warsaw. Uh, a look at the front side of one of the postcards provides us with some basic information. You can see that this was mailed to a Mr. Hyman Weber in New York. I will add that Hyman, who went by Chaim in America, was married to a woman named Rachel. So Chaim and Rachel Weber were the recipients of this and the other postcards in our collection. You can also see that this was a pre-printed postcard designed to be sent to the United States, which was still possible in 1941 because this was before Pearl Harbor. America was not at war with Germany unless mail continued between occupied Poland and America. And we know, or we can see, that the postcard was sent by Mordko Ostrega in the uh, caption up at the top or in the return address. Mordko is a Polish form of the Hebrew name Mordechai, and Mordko was married to Bethsheva, the only one of Rachel and Chaim's five children to still be in Poland in 1939. And you can see in the return address where Mordko and Bethsheva were living. They write that they are in Wołomin, and then the address is Osada Sosnowka, which translates to the Sosnowka district or Sosnowska ghetto. These post postcards were donated to the museum by Stanley Sanders and his wife Phyllis, Stanley was a member of our board and a major force in the creation of our museum before he passed away in 2018. Stanley's grandparents were Rachel and Chaim. They were the recipients of these postcards, and it was Stanley's uncle and aunt in Vowoman who sent them. Vowoman is not a very well-known ghetto and is an example of one of the Nazis' smaller ghettos. The woman had a population of around 17,000 in 1939, including about 2,700 Jews. In November 1939, a month after the Nazi invasion, Jews in the woman were ordered to wear a yellow star that identified them. It was the beginning of a series of restrictions that were imposed on the Jewish community. By November of 1940, a year later, they were forced into the town's ghetto in an area near the railroad line that ran through the woman. The postcards in our collection were sent between February and September of 1941, so beginning about four months after the ghetto was established. But when you read the postcards today, they seem relatively benign. There are frequent references to uh, a need for food. One thanks Rachel and Chaim for sending flour, buckwheat, macaroni, and salami. Another says that uh, we asked that if you send us more packages, send only packages with food. So there's definitely uh, some reference to the shortage of food in Poland. But there's nothing about the restrictions that were imposed, the crowding, the limitations on work, and the fact that they were really starving. And we'll see the benign language of these postcards is repeated in the postcards from the Theresien ghetto. The reason, of course, was that even though mail was allowed, all outgoing letters and postcards were reviewed by German censors to make sure outsiders would not learn about Nazi actions. A description from a survivor in a different ghetto listed the following 16 decrees that were limiting the life of Jews in the slightly larger town of Drahovich. You'll notice there's forced labor, oops, 
forced labor without pay uh, for all Jewish males aged 16 to 60. Um, and then there's a whole long list of, of other restrictions. Uh, priority going to Germans crossing the street. The, forbidden, uh, the fact that Jews were forbidden to own any kind of animals, uh, that electricity was cut off, they were forbidden to eat meat, forbidden to travel on any kind of conveyance, a whole series of restrictions. One survivor from Voomen later recounted some of what happened in that city. With the arrival, he wrote, of the Germans, every day brought with it new decrees and the community committee was required to provide more and more people for forced labor. Food prices skyrocketed, and those who did not have valuables to exchange with the farmers in the area suffered from starvation. The first victims began to fall. Jews were murdered for no reason. There were gendarmes who killed Jews just for the pleasure of murder and without having to, without having to explain the reason. Only a notice was sent to the Judenrat about the place where the body of the murdered Jews were lying, and the committee was responsible for the burial. When rumors grew that the turn of the Soshnovka ghetto for deportation and extermination was drawing near, it is impossible to describe the panic and the depression that, take that have taken place. The sound of crying, prayers, and pleading came from every Jewish home. Everyone felt his end was coming. People were running around like in a trap, searching for refuge in times of trouble. But all the roads were desolated and blocked. Bathsheba and Mordko couldn't write those kinds of things in their postcards, but maybe they tried to give hints. Perhaps they wrote things in their postcards that would have been jarring to Rachel and Chaim in New York, and thus would have been an alert that something was wrong back in Voomen. It's hard to read between the lines today and recognize what would have been strange or out of place to Chaim and Rachel in 1941. There is one example that seems strange given what we know, but it's hardly a clear statement of danger. In a postcard from March of 1941, where the date is clearly written, Mordko starts, Dear Parents, we received your postcard and we want to congratulate you on Dora's marriage. We wish her lots of luck. We are in good health. Dora was Bathsheba's sister who had moved to New York with her parents before the war had started. It doesn't seem particularly strange, except the odd thing was that Dora had gotten married a year earlier and indeed had just given birth to her first son. Mordko and Bathsheba certainly knew that Dora's marriage was not new in 1941. So this seems a strange thing to write. This is the type of thing that would have made Rachel and Chaim, I think, stop and question what was going on in Voomen to make Mordko and, Beth and Bathsheba write this. It's just this strange thing that might have set off some alarm bells in their heads. Unfortunately, there was little that Rachel and Chaim could have done in March of 1941, except to try to help get Bathsheba and Mordko out of Poland, which it appears they were trying to do, uh, and to send food, although there was no guarantee that the food they sent would actually make it into the ghetto. Before any headway could be made on getting Bathsheba and Mordko out, on October 3rd, 1942, the Jews in Vovomen, as the survivor recounted, were marched to the railroad track and forced onto trains to Dreplinka. This is one of very few photographs of the Jews being marched to the trains in Vovomen. Amazingly, the family reports that Bathsheba survived, but not much more is known as she was swept behind the Iron Curtain as Russia moved through Poland. As to Mordko or any of the other names mentioned in the postcards, it's likely that they were murdered in Treblinka, where between 700 and 900,000 Jews were murdered and only 67 escaped alive. The other four postcards we have come from a more well-known ghetto, the one established in Theresien or Theresienstadt in German. Known as the model ghetto, ghetto the first deportees from Prague arrived in what had been the fortress town of Theresien in November of 1941, and you can see in this contemporary aerial view the fortress shape to this town. By the middle of 1942, the original non-Jewish population had been evicted, and trainloads of German, Bohemian, and Austrian Jews had arrived. At the Wannsee Conference in Berlin in January of 1942, 
Reinhard Heydrich had gotten broad agreement about the implementation of mass murder of all the Jews of Europe. But he also had agreed that German Jews, particularly those with friends in high places, or who had served in distinction during World War I for the German army, or whose disappearance, for whatever reason, might be problematic, those Jews would be deported to Theresienstadt. These Jews were told that they would be permitted to buy an apartment in Theresien by signing over property to the Nazis. When they arrived, however, they were forced into crowded dormitories with minimal hygiene and forced into a starvation diet. By September of 1942, 53,000 people were living in Theresienstadt, a town that had been home to less than 8,000 people a year earlier. It's hard to imagine the crowding. Mass deportations to Theresienstadt ended by the middle of 1943. By then, the combination of death rates and outward deportations to Auschwitz and other death camps had reduced the crowding. By the end of October of 1944, only 11,000 inmates remained in Theresienstadt. One of those families that remained in October 1944 wrote the postcards in our exhibit. Here's the front of one of the cards. You can see it was sent by Dr. Uh, sorry, sent to Dr. Ilsa Reynoff in Sofia, Sofia, Bulgaria. Because Bulgaria was an Axis ally, mail continued between German-occupied Theresien and Sofia. I think you can also make out that the card was sent from Rosie Philipson, and you can see the return address is Theresienstadt, and then the address. Badhausgasse 1, or number one bathhouse alley. We can even find the building on a map of the fortress turned camp, as you can see here. The map, of course, does not convey the crowding, the sanitation, the starvation conditions. Rosie Philipson and her husband Ferdinand had lived in the small hamlet of Feldberg, northeast of Berlin before the war. We have a picture of Ferdinand uh, on the wall of photographs just as you enter our exhibits. Ferdinand comes across as a strong and confident man in the photograph. He was in his 60s when this picture was taken, so a mature but healthy man in 1934 with two adult children, Ilsa, who was the recipient of the postcards, and Hans, who later changed his name to Frank. He was, uh, uh, he, Ilsa appears to have seen the writing on the wall early and fled Germany after Hitler came into power in 1933, settling in Bulgaria where she worked as a pediatrician. Ferdinand and Rosie stayed in Feldberg, but things went downhill. In 1937, Ferdinand was forced to se sell his successful dry goods and clothing store to new supposedly Aryan owners for only a fraction of its value. A year later, during the pogrom known as Kristallnacht, he was taken into protective custody and placed in a detention center in a neighboring town where he suffered a stroke and then was released. His son Hans, living in Stuttgart in 1938, was also arrested on Kristallnacht, eventually getting released with the help of his sister and some English relatives who provided the paperwork that enabled him to move to England. Made it not surprisingly, perhaps, he later fought against the Germans and was in the Battle of Dunkirk. As an aside, let me just say that we have um, another photo I wanted to mention. This is a photograph of Hans's wife, uh, Ruth Arnfeld. She also escaped to England from Germany, thanks to some well-timed letters of support before the war started. Their daughter, Miriam, would move to the United States and settle in Nassau County and donate some of the family's documents to our museum. Ferdinand and Rosie, despite the events of 1937 and 1938, stayed in Feldberg, and things seemed to settle down after Kristallnacht. But in November of 1942, they were arrested and taken to Berlin, and then on November 19, 1942, deported to Theresienstadt. So just about the same time that the Jews in Volwomen were being sent to Treblinka, Ferdinand and Rosie were being deported to Theresienstadt. The first of the postcards we have is written by Ferdinand in April of 1943, a little over four months having, after having arrived in Theresienstadt. 
unable to write in details about the horrendous conditions or terror in which they were facing, the postcard text is not notable. I am happy, he says, to be able to tell you today that mother and I are healthy. We hope to hear the same from you and look forward to receiving news soon. The mail here works regularly. Postcards, letters, parcels are permitted and arrive promptly. If we cannot answer soon because the mail is overloaded, please do keep us constantly informed. We think and talk about all of you a lot. How are the dear children, our good Vani, Ilsa's husband, and you yourself? Best wishes for all of you, also for Feldberg and Berlin. But if you look at the handwriting, it hardly suggests the upbeat tone of the letter. I know the top of this image is a bit dark, but you can see the crossouts and the jittery hand and the sloppiness. Here's a zoomed in view where again, you can see how much um, changing and, and corrections and mistakes were made on this handwritten note. You might think, okay, it's not surprising for someone who has suffered a stroke to have this kind of handwriting, but the other letters from Ferdinand show a smooth and confident hand. The handwriting in this postcard may well have been written as a way to suggest that all was not as well as the words in this letter proclaimed. Miriam Fingerhud, who donated the postcards to us, also drew my attention to another strange reference in a note written three months later in August of 1943 by Rosie Philipson. Again, to the casual reader, the letter doesn't appear no noteworthy. She writes, I want to thank you so much for your good wishes for my birthday and your cards from June. We were very happy to hear good news from you. We are all so well. He go and then she goes on. Um, she does include the sentence, unfortunately, Uncle Kurt and Aunt Berta died of old age. I hope that we will hear again from you soon and we join you in your good wishes. Warmest wishes to all of you and also from your father. The strange reference is the sentence that says, Uncle Kurt and Aunt Berta died of old age. Uncle Kurt and Aunt Berta were only in their early 30s in 1943. Ilsa would certainly have known that they were not elderly and would have recognized that they had not died from old age. Just a subtle reference and hardly a clear warning, but perhaps a red flag, something to suggest to Ilsa that all was not as it seemed. That's about all that Ferdinand and Rosie could do as they watched those around them die or be deported. We have one more postcard from Rosie in January of 1944 that again reads as if nothing bad is happening. But only a few months later on June 2nd of 1944, Rosie died in Theresienstadt, apparently from starvation. Ferdinand survived and was liberated and evacuated to Frankfurt. He then returned to Feldberg, where he tried unsuccessfully to get his store back. According to the records kept by the Nazis, of the 100 people who were deported to Theresienstadt with Ferdinand and Rosie on November 19, 1942, Ferdinand was one of only 10 to survive the war. Rosie was part of the 90% who were murdered. I'm going to stop there. I find these postcards difficult to work with because on their face, they appear to report that nothing is out of the ordinary in the ghettos. But as I've tried to show today, a close reading and some context suggests that there's much more to what, uh, much more to them than what they initially seem to offer. So thank you again for joining me. If you had questions, <coughs> please type them in the Q&A window and I'll do what I can to answer them. And let me, as always, remind you of some other upcoming programs we have. This coming Monday at 11.30, we are holding a virtual panel discussion about some of the anti-Chinese and anti-Jewish responses that have come with the coronavirus, paying particular attention to our local community. And I should add that we're collaborating for this panel discussion with a number of other organizations, including the Nassau County Office of Asian American Affairs, the Long Island Chinese American Association, the Chinese American Association of North Hempstead, the Jewish Community Relations Council of Long Island, and the Long Island American Jewish Committee. Next Tuesday, also at 11.30, we're holding a program with Holocaust survivor Ruth Mermelstein and her daughter Bernice Lerner, who's just published a book that weaves together her mother's amazing story with the story of a British doctor and the fact that they came together at the liberation of Bergen-Belsen. And then next Wednesday, I'll be back for another edition of my Curator's Corner, 
looking at a photograph in our gallery from Baden-Baden. I hope you'll join me for those presentations. You can find a full list of our programs and more details on our website at www.hmtcli.org under the events tab. And I also, also hope you'll make a contribution to support online programs like this while our building is closed. Okay, let me look at some of the questions. Um, when the packages of food were sent, did the people in the ghettos get all the food or was some of it taken? Yeah, the, oftentimes the packages of food that were sent were not received. I know Miriam Fingerhut told me that the packages that were mentioned in some of the postcards uh, that, that her family had that described the food she knew from her communication with her family that they didn't actually get it. Uh, so no, mostly uh, that was just just to bring food for, and then it was confiscated before it made it into the ghettos. Sometimes, of course, it did make it in, but it was hardly enough to sustain the diet of people in the ghettos. Okay, well, thanks very much again for joining me on this, and I look forward to seeing you at some of our other programs soon.